Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, I'm ready to get into the Word of the Lord. Are you ready to get into the Word of the Lord? <laughs> okay, all right, come on. There we are. It just took you a little while. It's all right, okay. Hey, listen, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going, to go to for, I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me as we honor and reverence the Lord and as we go before the Lord in prayer? Lord, we come before you today, Father. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. Your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, why is that? Because that's where your presence is, Lord. The, the word says that when other two or more are gathered together, that you are in the midst of us. And Lord, we thank you that you are here in this place today. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman. God, we don't come into church for entertainment. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you, and we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so, Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and minister to us today to bring things to our remembrance, to show us things out of the Word of God. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the Word that we would hear today, that it would be a seed planted into good ground in our hearts. Lord, as we walk out of this place, that we would live it, fulfill it, Lord, and we would act, it, act on it in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, so the same blessing things that we ask upon ourselves today. Lord, we ask upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and all around the world that are teaching and preaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you would be with them. Lord, we lift up our Catholic brothers and sisters and our uh, Adventist brothers and sisters and our Methodist and Episcopalian and Baptist brothers and sisters, our Lutheran brothers and sisters and our Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you that you set your hand upon a Harvest Christian Fellowship today, Lord, on Sandals and on the Grove Church. Lord, I thank you that you set your hand upon the Way World Outreach on Ecclesia Christian on Emmanuel Baptist, on all the churches all in the Inland Empire and all around the world. Father, on Oak Valley, Crossroads Christian Center, Abundant Living Family Church, all the churches, the great churches all around the world. Lord, too many to mention here in this prayer, but Lord, I thank you that your hand be upon them. Lord, we are all mem many members of the same body, all working together to serve in the ministry and to grow the kingdom of God. And we glorify you, we magnify you, and Lord, we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Well, as you're being seated, why don't you grab your Bibles, the, the sword of the Spirit, the wonderful Word of God. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews as we continue our study in the book of Hebrews. For those of you who are just joining us or maybe you've just been, been with us for a little while, we've been going through the book of Hebrews line upon line, precept upon precept. What that means is the Bible was written that way, thought on thought, line on line. And that's how we're studying it on the, on the weekend mornings. And so we've been going in our study of the book of Hebrews now for quite some time. And we find ourselves now in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. And it's quite an amazing journey. I tell you, it's just a, a, an amazing revelation of the word of God and the spirit of God speaking into our lives and into our hearts what God has got for us. And now we find ourselves in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Now I'm going to continue. Uh, this is part number three this morning of, of a, a series that we've been doing called The Proof of Our Belief. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And the idea behind the proof of our belief is you've heard the statement, you've heard the term, that actions speak louder than words. And it's not just enough for you and I to say, okay, I believe, I love, or this or that, that rather the proof of our belief, the proof of our, our systems on the inside of our beliefs really comes from the outside. And we're going to talk about the term obedience. Obedience being the proof of our belief. Because if we really believe and, and, and grab a hold of the Word of God, then we're going to obey and follow and do what the Word of God says. And so we know that talk is cheap, so we're talking about obedience to the Word of God. Now let me emphasize first and foremost, before we go any further, that I am not stressing that we are saved or that we are justified by our works. We know that we're not. We know that we are justified by Jesus Christ and by the grace of God, but it is on the inside of us that the Bible tells us that faith without works is dead. So we have got to, God has a certain expectation on the inside of us that when we have a belief or something on the inside of us that there ought to be an outward proof or an outward evidence of that belief, and that is the obedience to the Word of God. So today, as we resume our thoughts on uh, the proof of our belief, we pick up in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, and the ninth verse once again. Hebrews in the fifth chapter, the ninth verse, is speaking about Jesus Christ, and it says, Jesus Christ, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation. Now we know this, this is unarguable, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except through him. He tells us this in the book of John. 
And that Jesus Christ is the one that, that, that was the author of eternal salvation. Jesus Christ is the one that came and bridged the gap between us and God, between mankind and God. And he filled in the gap of sin and he put himself on the, on the cross as the one that, to bear our sin and our shame. Therefore, Jesus is the author. He is the one that eternal salvation rests on. The Bible also tells us that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So we know that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation, but the interesting point and what we focus on today is this last part of the, ver of the ninth chapter, and that says, He is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Now, why doesn't the Bible just say He's the author of eternal salvation to all who believe in Him? Well, because of this very statement that we've been talking about, that it's not just about belief. You know, if that was the case, then you and I could come and say, all right, guess what? Lord, I believe in you. I, I say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to continue to do my life the way I want it to be done. I'm going to continue to live my life the way I have been living and no change, nothing, because I believe. But you see, there's more to it than that because what kind of reflection, what kind of ambassadors, as the Bible tells us, would we be if we live a life how we normally live and how we once lived before we knew Jesus Christ? You see, the belief inside of us causes something to happen on the inside of us. And all of a sudden, on the inside, from the inside out, we start to obey and we start to reflect the will of God in our lives. And that is the desire of God for us to obey and to follow the word of God. Last week, I won't spend too much time, last week Pastor Jim brought a thought, we're going to continue this thought, and the idea is what it takes to be truly obedient. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time, if you didn't grab a hold of last week's message, I encourage you, you can visit us online and get it online, listen or watch online for free uh, on the webpage, or you can grab a CD, uh, all we do is we just cover our costs for the CDs, we don't charge crazy amounts on the CDs, but I encourage you to grab a hold of that, because we're going to pick up on the thought that Pastor Jim had last week, now, let me just tell you, I'm not going to spend any time, you can go and listen to him, but he, Pastor Jim told us last week that we had to be willing to, obedi to be obedient, in order to be truly obedient, we had to be willing, we had to be humble, to allow God to be in control. We had to be aware that we could fall into sin or that we could mess up. And finally, that we could be, we have to be wholehearted in order to be truly obedient. Now, the idea of true obedience is, let me say this, you can be obedient without truly be obedient. Does this make sense? Does this, let me give you the illustration. I'm sure you've never done this. I'm sure this is not you, but I know that you probably know somebody maybe that has done this. Maybe you don't want to point that person out, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's not you. That you've come to church but you've not come to church. I'm sure that you've been in church before where you sat in the chair and maybe you were thinking about the football game or your stomach was grumbling and you were thinking about lunch. You were in church, but your mind, your, your, your thoughts, your attention was somewhere else. See, so you say, oh, I'm obedient because I'm in church, but really on the inside, the true obedience is you were somewhere else. Now, like I said, I know this wasn't you. I know that that's none of you here in the second service. That's, that's the third service, but... Um, you understand that you can be obedient, but not truly obedient. What we're talking about is true obedience, real obedience. And so these are what the ideas that came from. So today we're going to resume that thought of what it takes to be truly obedient. I'm excited for what God's got in store because I know that God's got the great and many things in store for us. And today God's given me some more things out of the word of God to talk about true obedience from the inside. So let's continue on that thought of what it takes to be truly obedient. Are you guys with me this morning? Can we do that? Okay, number one for today, what it takes to be truly obedient, what it takes for us to really be obedient is love. Number one for today is love. You see, the love that we have for God should drive us, should be the motivating factor for us to do the will and the ways of God in our lives. You see, we love God because, the Bible tells us that we love God because God first loved us. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ uh, died for us even while we were still sinners. You see, so God had shed a, a love upon us from his heart that the Bible tells us that God for love, so loved the world in John the third chapter that he gave. And it's because God has loved us that we respect and we love God in return. We have seen and felt the love of God in our lives and it's that love for God that is a driving or a motivating factor for us to be obedient or for us to do the will of God. But you're not here to listen to me. You're not here to, to take what I have to say. Let me tell you what the Word of God has to say, specifically what Jesus says about this very subject, about obedience and the love of God. If you've got your Bibles, let's go to the book of John in the 14th chapter. John in the 14th chapter. Now, as you're turning to John in the 14th chapter... 
Let me give you a little bit of background. Here Jesus is speaking to his disciples. They're, they're having that, the famous Last Supper. And Judas has, has been announced as the one that will betray Jesus. And Judas has left to do what he is going to do. Now Jesus is spending some time. Now these are, the, these are the last few hours that Jesus has with his disciples. And shortly after John, the 14th chapter, he begins to take them on a journey through the garden. And then he finds himself in the garden where he begins to pray. And it's at the garden when he's praying uh, intercessory prayer and, and about what's about to happen that the, the, the guards come and they take Jesus. And then we know the story. Jesus is brought before judgment and he goes to the cross. So these are the last few hours that Jesus has with his disciples. And here in the 14th chapter, Jesus is really solidifying. He's reiterating or he's, he's kind of, uh, 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 of going over again and, and kind of playing. Placing on them the last kind of thought, the closing thoughts of their, their few years of ministry that they've had together. And now he's kind of solidifying the thoughts to them as he's ministering to them. In John the 14th chapter, I want to go pick up in verse number 15. John the 14th chapter, the 15th verse says this. If, now i got to stop there because we know that if is the biggest little word in the Bible. If is a conditional statement. It's not a blanket statement. It means that if, meaning if you do this, if you are obedient or if you do this, this is what happens. And so Jesus says, if you love me, you really want to show your love? If you love me, keep my commandments. See, obedience is keeping his commandments. When we do what Jesus told us to do, to love one another, to, to, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to, to do what the, the commandments of Jesus are, the commandments and the word of God are, that is obedience in our life. And true obedience is through our love for Jesus, we keep his commandments or we are obedient. But let me say this. It's, it's one thing for Jesus to say this, but I want to draw your attention. Now, a few verses down, six verses down in John the 14th chapter, Jesus says something interesting again in the 21st verse. And Jesus says this in the 21st verse, which is put it up on the overhead. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. Interesting. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, Jesus has said this two times within six verses within the same thought he said if you love me you'll keep my commandments he says he who has my commandments and keeps them loves me now don't you know when jesus speaks we ought to listen there's no it's inarguable that when jesus is speaking we read the words of jesus and the teaching of jesus we ought to hear it but when jesus says something and then he says something again we ought to perk our ears up to listen okay he's he's making a point here but the interesting thing is, is two verses down in verse number 23, Jesus says it again. Look what it says. Jesus answered and said to them, him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Now listen, Jesus in the same thought has repeated himself three times. Now it is time for us to sit up in our chairs and say, okay, God is speaking and he is making a statement. Jesus is, is finalizing his last thoughts with his disciples before he goes to the cross. And what he says to them is, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You will obey. You will be obedient. The proof of your belief, the proof of your love will shine through your obedience to what I've taught you. What an amazing statement. We have got to listen to the words of Christ. Later on in the book of John, in John the 21st chapter, I'm not going to take you there. You can write it down and read it later. The disciples are having breakfast with Jesus. Jesus has died on the cross. He's come back and he's, he's shown himself to the disciples on several occasions now. And now this is the, one of the, the final time that they see him. And Jesus is, is, is sitting on the shore of a lake and they're having breakfast in the morning and they're, they're cooking some fish and there's Peter and John and a few of the other disciples are there. And Peter... Jesus draws his attention to Peter and he says something interesting to Peter. Before I tell you what Jesus says, let me remind you that as Jesus draws his attention to Peter, let me remind you about Peter. Peter, as Jesus was being tried before the, the high priest, Jesus prophesied to Peter that you would deny me three times. And Peter was out there in the crowd and they said, hey, aren't you disciple of Jesus? Don't we know you? Don't you hang out with Jesus? Don't you know Jesus? And Peter denied Jesus three times just like Jesus said he would. And here's Peter. We love Peter. Peter's the one that was vocal. Peter was the one that was all heart sometimes. You know, he was the one that walked on the water with Jesus. I mean, Peter is an amazing character in the Bible, amazing man of the Word of God. And here Peter is carrying the weight of his denial of Jesus Christ. Peter thought that he was ready to go to the cross with Jesus, yet he denied Jesus when the, when it, when it, the truth came down. When the, when the rubber met the road, Peter denied Jesus. Now he's carrying the weight. So now as, there, as this is the last time that Jesus meets with them, Jesus says to Peter, he says to Peter these things. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? 
Peter says, yes, Lord, I do. And Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. Okay. And then he says again to Peter, right afterwards, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter says, yes, Lord, I do. And he says, tend to my sheep. Okay. Okay. All right. Right again. Third time, Peter says, or Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now the Bible tells us that Peter began to grow frustrated. Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, take care of my sheep. Three times, boom, 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 Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? Asking Peter to examine himself. Do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I do. And he said, take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Take care of my, my flock. And so all of a sudden now Peter has something inside of him. And now later as Jesus has ascended 50 days after Jesus has died, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon the, the 120 that are in the upper room. And here's this man that denied Jesus Christ, the one that could not confess Jesus Christ when he was on trial. Now here's Peter, the one that Jesus focused on, the one that Jesus singled out as he was in breakfast with everybody. And here's Peter on that day when the Holy Spirit came upon him that jumped up and started preaching the word of God to the multitudes, to anybody who would hear. Peter rose up and did exactly what Jesus had instructed him to do because Peter loved him. And Peter was the one that rose to be the leader of the first church. Why? Because of his love for Jesus Christ. You see, it is our love for God. It is our love because he first loved us because of that love that we ought to be obedient and we ought to do what God has commanded us to do to keep his commandments with us. Are you with, are you with me this morning? So we're talking about what it takes to be truly obedient. Number two for this morning, number two is that it takes faith. Don't you know, it takes a, a great deal of faith to allow God to be the leader. Now, Pastor Jim said this last week, he saw a bumper sticker once on somebody's car that said, God is my co-pilot. Now, if you were here last week, you remember that Pastor Jim said, no, God is not your co-pilot because a sense of humility says, God, you are in control. So not God is not our co-pilot. God is not in the passenger seat saying, okay, take a right over here. All right, next stop, take a left. Okay, go over here and, and go 2.5 miles. No, God is not our GPS unit. God is the driver behind the wheel and you and I are are along for the ride, but, oh, there's a, big, there's a big but right there. It takes faith to allow God to do that because I don't know about you, but in my life there's been many times where I've experienced that doing the word of God, keeping the commandments of God, being obedient to the word of God has rubbed my flesh or rubbed my natural sense or how about this, rubbed those around me, those in my family or those in the workplace or those in, in wherever you're at. They might say, hey, what are you doing? That's, that's, that's not normal. That, that Jesus thing, that's, that's weird. Why are you doing this to us? Because it takes faith for us to step out of our comfort zone, to allow God to be the leader. It takes a great deal of faith because don't you know, it doesn't always line up or coincide God's directions, line up or coincide with our wants, our desires, and our will. But God has something better and greater in store for us through his plan, and we have got to submit to that and through faith allow him to do that. There's a man in the, in the Bible by the name of Abraham. I think you know who Abraham is. You know who Father Abraham, he had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them. And so were you. <laughs> kind of get where I'm going. Abraham. You guys know Abraham? And the Bible tells us about a man by the name of Abraham. Before God had called him Abraham, God had called him, his name was Abram. And let's turn to Genesis in the 12th chapter and look at what God says to Abram. Genesis in the 12th chapter. Now, if you were with us on Wednesday night, Pastor Dan was in Genesis the 11th chapter talking about Abram or Abraham's father. And so we pick off exactly where Pastor Dan left off on Wednesday night. And we read about this man named Abram. In Genesis in the 12th chapter, Abram has been brought out of the land where he was born by his father. And they're, deal, they're dwelling in this place called Haran. And there he is with his family. There his father has brought him. There he is with his, his nephew and, 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 and those who are with him. Now Abraham had, had many servants. Abraham had a, a, a great deal of possessions. The Bible tells us later on that Abraham and his nephew had so much that the land was unable to contain them together that they had to split ways because it was just too much. And so God says to Abraham while he's in the place where his father had brought him to. Interesting thing is in Genesis this is the 12th chapter in the first verse. God says this. Now the Lord said to Abram, who was later to be called Abraham, get out of your country, from your family 
and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. You see, you and I, we look back on the story of Abram or Abraham and we see this in hindsight. We know that God is taking Abraham to the place that is to be called the promised land. What is modern day Israel? See, he wasn't there and God said, I wanted to bring you to this place. But in Abraham's time, when God spoke this to Abraham or Abram as he is right here, he didn't know where he was going. God said, get out of your land. Get away from your family. Leave what you know behind and I will show you on the way out. As we're going, where to go? Now that takes a great deal of faith. I don't know about you, but for me, whenever I go on a vacation, my wife's in the back watching with our, with our baby girl right now, and she knows this. She'll probably chuckle when she hears this. I can't handle going on a vacation, and I don't know like everything, like the reservation number and the confirmation number in two different forms, so that way if I lost this one, I can go to the home. I mean, i got to have it all worked out, all planned out. I remember we went on a vacation to Seattle one time, and we didn't plan that out. We said, oh, we'll just get a hotel when we get out from the airport. And we drove around for like seven hours lost as we could be because we couldn't figure out what hotel to stay. no I don't want to stay in that one because we stayed in the one over here and it smelled like smoke and we were just joking you know we just couldn't make a decision and we were fighting like cats and dogs because we didn't know where to go we didn't know what to do and here God is saying Abraham leave everything you know Leave where your father, the land that your father had brought you into. Leave your, your father's house behind and everything that your identity was in. Take it all away and go to a place. And I'm not going to tell you where you're going, but I'm going to tell you that on the way you'll see it. But you just have faith in me. And it took a great deal of faith for Abraham to do this. Interestingly enough is we can take the story of Abraham and apply this to our lives. When you and I gave God or Jesus Christ our hearts and we gave him all of our lives, don't you know that God tells us, hey, get out of the land of your family. Get out of the land of your father. Leave the past behind your identity, who you once were. That is no longer who you are. You leave that and you go to a place that I will show you. You see, when we got saved, we didn't know exactly what God had in store for us. And even to this day, we don't know what tomorrow holds. It's a faith walk for us to trust in the Lord and know God will direct us, God will lead us, and we have got to trust in God and, and in faith to know that God has got our interests in mind. And the Bible tells us later on that Abraham was 75 years old when he picked up and moved. You know, this economy and the downturn, many of you have had to learn to do from, have taken one profession that you've done and had to change to professions to find a job or to find employment. And that's a tough thing to do, especially after years and years. Here Abraham is well beyond the age of retirement. Abraham is 75 years old. And here he leaves, he uproots everything he has and he leaves because God told him to. He left in faith. In Hebrews 11, chapter the 8th verse, I'll just put it up on the overhead, says this, that by faith, remember we're talking about the, the proof of our belief is obedience. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Get that? Abraham obeyed by faith when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance. That was his place. But he said, no, God said, I have something better for you. And he went out not knowing where he was going. It's going to take faith for you and I to journey. Abraham didn't have Mayflower movers. Abraham didn't have starving students movers. Abraham had many possessions and they didn't have the Interstate 10 or U-Haul to rent a truck or a trailer. They had to do this all by hand. It was a lot of work and it took a long time to do these type of things. It wasn't just a, okay, here we go, I'm going to pack a suitcase. Listen, if you've got kids, you know. It takes you like three hours to get out of the house in the morning. Imagine uprooting everything in one day because God said go. And I'm not going to tell you where, just go. That is a great step of faith. And so in our lives and so in our obedience, we have got to step out in faith and trust that God is in control. Amen? Amen. We're talking about what it takes to be truly obedient. Number three, number three for this morning, number three, what it takes to be truly obedient is a word that I, that, 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 the word, this word is dedication. How about taking that word dedication, let's expound on it. Endurance, commitment, uh, 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 to see it through. You see, obedience is not just a one-time action. Obedience doesn't mean obedience to God. True obedience doesn't say, okay, God, I promised that I was going to be in church in 2013. Here I am today. I've done my part. Now it's time for you to do your part. I'm good. Hey, God, I got saved. I gave you my heart. I gave you my life. That's all I need to do for the rest of my life. I did my one act of obedience, and here I am. 
But rather, it's something that we're going to have to be dedicated to doing because it's something that's going to come up over and over and over and over and over again. We are going to be presented all throughout our lives opportunities to obey or to disobey the word of God. We were just talking about Abraham. Look at Abraham. God told him, get out of your land. Okay, so Abraham was faithful. He got out. God told him to wander. I will show you. So Abraham, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, 9th verse, that Abraham was a wanderer. And in, through his faith, he wandered as God led him. So God tested him even as he left. Now Abraham said, okay, God, show it to me. And God says, I'm going to let you kind of walk around for a little bit. Then Abraham, then God says to Abraham, all right, you're going to have a son. Well, Abraham's wife wasn't able to. So God was testing him there. Are you going to be faithful and believe that I can? Then Abraham has a son, Isaac, and God tests him again. And he says, take your most valuable possession, your son, up onto the mountain and sacrifice him. And you know the story. He didn't do that. God was testing him. But you see, God didn't just call Abraham out of his father's land. That was just the start. God had tested him and continually tried him over and over and over again. In our lives, it's going to be a continual test. It's not just a singular act of obedience. Are you with me today? It's going to take dedication. It's going to take endurance. In Luke, the sixth chapter, if you've got your Bibles and you want to turn there, Luke, the sixth chapter, Jesus paints a picture for us uh, to those who are obedient. This is also, uh, you can find this also in Matthew, the seventh chapter. In Luke, the 6th chapter, in the 46th verse, Jesus says this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Interesting. For whoever comes to me and hears these sayings, or hears my saying, and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Jesus says, whoever comes and hears and does, hears and does, obedience. Whoever is obedient to what I am saying, let me show you what they're like. In verse number 48, he goes on to say, and he, let's go ahead and put it up. He says, he's like a man who builds a house who dug deep into the foundation and laid the foundation on the rock. The flood arose, the stream bit vehemently, violently, repeatedly against that house and could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. And you know the story. He goes on to say, he who does these and who hears these words and doesn't do them, their house falls because they didn't build a foundation. But here Jesus says that when you do what you hear, when you hear the sayings, of, you hear the word of God, and you do them, you apply them, you're obedient diligently, that the, the, the storms, the streams, the floods of life are going to come, they're going to come, they're going to knock on your door, they're going to beat on your door, on your house. Don't you know life will beat violently on your front door trying to kick it in? Don't you know that the enemy is beating on your front door trying to get you to fall? Don't you know that society is beating down on your front door trying to get you to cave in to justify where they believe? And here the Bible says that the storms of life will beat violently, repeatedly, but the house will not fall. Why? Because they were diligent and he dug deep, the Bible says, and he laid his foundation on the rock. All because he heard these sayings and he did them. So you and I are like the three little pigs. We built our house out of brick. And when the big bad wolf, the devil, comes to huff and puff and try to blow our house down, guess what? Ain't going to do nothing because we dug deep in our diligence. An interesting thought as well is that here he says that he was diligent. He dug deep, impl implying that he worked hard. Digging deep is not easy. A shallow hole is easy to dig, but a deep hole to get down to bedrock, to get down to rock takes a lot of work. You know, there are channels on TV, entire networks dedicated to contractors and to building programs or building projects that have gone awry or that have gone bad because maybe the contractor tried to cut corners here and there to save costs. And you and I have got to be diligent in our lives to make sure that we dig deep, that we don't cut corners in our obedience to God, that we don't say, okay, God, you told me to do this, so I'll do a little bit of this, and I'll do a little bit of that, and I'm going to leave this little section out right here because ah, it just didn't rub, it rubbed me the wrong way, but rather to be diligent, to dig deep, to lay our foundations on the rock, to do it the right way. Diligence uh, has got to be a part of what we do in, in our obedience. And it drives us to true obedience because it's not a singular act. Are you with me? Yeah. Praise God. One more thing for this morning. Can we do one more? One more for this morning. Are you still here? Are you still in church? You're in church, but are you still in church? All right. Last one for this morning. What it takes to be truly obedient. Number four, fear. 
Now, I'm not talking about that. Ah! Woke some of you up right now. Kind of fear. The reverence, the honor, the respect of God, the fear of the Lord. You see, what happens is in our day and age, and, and what, we, what we like is we, you know, we, 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 we generally, we're like water. We take the path of least resistance. And what we like to hear is, and, and, I, don't, and I don't want to downplay this at all, is we like to think that God is this, this big, happy, jolly Santa Claus man in the sky with a big white beard that he's just oh, 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 beaming with love. And God is. I'm not, I'm not downplaying this at all. But at the same time, God is one to be feared. God is one to be reverenced and respected. See, what happens is we try to encapsulate or enclose or to wrap our minds around all that God is in our finite ability to think. But God is infinite. God is, was there from the beginning. He'll be there at the end. God sees all. He knows all. He is all. And so we try to bring this great and mighty and this wonderful God into our thinking. And what happens is we take the path of least resistance and we focus solely upon the love of God, which is an amazing and important part. But we lose oftentimes the fear or the respect or the honoring that God deserves. You see, if we are to be obedient or truly obedient, we ought to be so because God is worthy of it. Why? Because God is God and we are just little old me sitting down here on the world doing what we can to please God because God is worthy of our obedience out of our respect, out of our reverence for him. You know, you think about it like this, like a son to a father. Uh, I remember even growing up, dad, there was a sense, I knew that my dad loved me. Why? Because he put a, a roof over my head. He put shoes on my feet. He took care of me. He did what he could to, he, you know, when I wanted to play sports, he, he supported me. He did whatever I could. But there were times when I would hear the statement from my mom, wait till your father comes home. That all of a sudden, I would get the idea of fear, of respect, of honor. Because I know that if I acted out of line, that because my dad loved me, that he would do something or he would discipline me so that I wouldn't continue to do that. And we think that God is this, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You just do whatever you want to do. It's okay. Don't, don't worry about respecting me. Don't worry about honoring me. You just thought he loved you. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that because God loves us, he chastises us. He, he disciplines us because he loves us. We have got to have a healthy fear. And when we have that reverence and that fear for God, it drives us to a place of obedience. Because we know that God, when he speaks, we listen. That when God tells us something, that when we read the word of God that says to do this or to be like this or to, to, to not do this or to not do that, we know that it's not like, oh, God. But rather, okay, yes, sir, I got it. We love him because he loved us, but we also fear and reverence him. Jesus told us, don't fear man, because man can kill you, sure. All right, that's a bummer. But fear God who can not only kill, but destroy the soul in hell. It's a very real picture. We try to wrap this around, and then some people say, oh, but Pastor Luke, now you're preaching that God's a mean God with a two-by-four in heaven trying to beat you over the head, and I'm not saying that. But we have got to grab the whole picture, not just part of it. That God is a God of love, but God is also a God to be respected. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel in the 15th chapter. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a man by the name of Paul, or Saul, excuse me. Saul was, uh, uh, was a man, he was the first king of Israel. God had anointed him to be the very first king of Israel, and Saul had, had many great exploits. And, 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 and now Saul has a very clear commandment from God in the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel. And God tells Saul in the very first verse, to go and to wipe out, to consume, to utterly destroy Amalek. Now let me go back before I go any further because you're like, wow, God's telling somebody to like just complete, I mean, it's pretty harsh. Thank God we live in the New Testament with a God of grace through Jesus Christ who was the propitiation for our sins because God tells Saul to obliterate this people. Because back in Exodus, when Moses and the, and the Hebrews, the children of, uh, uh, of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, 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 the children of Israel, were on their way to the promised land, there was a king by the name of Amalek who came, and he had a decision. He had a choice he could make. Here was this great numer number of people, and they were coming. He could support them. He could come alongside of them and say, praise God, I heard from God, you spoke to me, or God spoke to me, and come on in, let's build. But you know what Amalek decided? He decided to go and make war and try to destroy them while they were in their weakness. 
And you might know the story. They came and they made war and Moses went up on top of a hill. And as Moses' hands were raised, the battle raged on and the, and the children of Israel, they were winning. And as Moses' hands would grow tired and his arms would come down, that they would begin to lose. And so Moses had helpers that would come on each side and they won. This is the same people. And God did not forget the decision that they had made. And so now God tells Saul, it's time for them to be consumed because of their sin. And so God tells Saul, obliterate them, wipe them out, every person. I mean, this is brutal stuff we're talking about. He tells them, take every person, every living person in Amalek. Don't take from their, their livestock, don't take any, wipe out, kill their cows, kill their sheep, kill their land. Don't take the spoils, don't take anything from them. Leave them there to rot and, and, and die. They have had their chance and they missed it. So Saul gathers an army, he goes out there and he, he battles against Amalek and he wipes out the people. But Saul does some interesting things. Saul takes the king, Agag, as a hostage. He takes him as a prisoner. Saul allows the people of his army to start taking the best of the livestock, the best of the cows, the best of the spoils of the people of Amalek, and they take it with him, even though God said, don't touch it. So God says to Samuel that Saul disobeyed him. So Samuel goes to confront Saul and Samuel says, the Lord spoke to me that you disobeyed me. And Saul says, I did everything that God told me to. And Samuel's like, much like Pastor Jim is, where he doesn't pull the punches and he doesn't beat around the bush. He talks in San Bernardino language. And Samuel says to Saul, why do I hear sheep? <laughs> so Samuel says, God spoke to me. Let me tell you what he said. And Saul says, okay, tell me what, what did God say? Samuel goes on to tell Saul, God told me to tell you that when you were small or when you were little in your own eyes, God made you ruler over the people. When you thought, when you had a respect, when you realized that God was in control, when you realized that God had reverence, but now God spoke to you, gave you a clear commandment, and you didn't respect God enough to carry out his commandment, and you did what you wanted to do. Let me tell you something. When somebody tells you something, if you're in the military and your commanding officer tells you to do something, and you do it the way you want it to be done, not the way they want it to be done, don't you know that there is a lack of reverence and there is a lack of respect for the order that came in? When you're a child and your parent told you to clean your room and you shoved everything underneath the bed or in the closet and then mom came and looked at the room and thought it was clean, there was a lack of respect for what they really had told you to do and you were not really being obedient. That was actually, uh, mom's over there saying, yeah, amen. <laughs> There's a lack of respect. And Saul had a lack of respect or reverence for God in the sense that he did what he wanted to do. And Saul justified it by saying, I did what God commanded me to do. I wiped them out. Why is the king alive? Why is there sheep? Look what Samuel says to him in verse number uh, 20, 22. Samuel says to Saul, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And heed, the fat of, and heed than the fat of the rams. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to do and listen, the word of God is better than to take the fat of the land. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as is, as is iniquity and idolatry. And because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Look what Saul says, verse number 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Saul's fear was gone from the Lord because Saul was big in his own mind at this point, And he was afraid of what the people would think of him rather than what God had told him and to live out the commands of God. Now, thank God you and I live in a time of the New Testament. We have this thing, this wonderful thing called grace on us where God is not going to necessarily smote us for disobedience. But heaven forbid you and I live in a case in like, what Paul, like Saul did that we justify our lives and we justify our sins and we say, God, it's good enough because you have grace. Let me tell you something. The fear of the Lord says, God, you told me not to live like this. God, you said not to act like this. God, you told us that adulterers and fornicators would not enter the kingdom of God and because you're God I'm going to listen and it doesn't matter what somebody around me tells me I believe that you and I'm going to respect what you say and I'm going to live my life in obedience to it because you're worthy of it and the fear of the Lord drives us into true obedience 
So today we talked about what it takes to be truly obedient. Number one is it takes love. We love God because he first loved us and because God is a God of love that drives us to want to be obedient. A willingness, a wholeheartedness like Pastor Jim talked about last week. Secondly, it takes faith. It's not going to be an easy journey always. It doesn't always end in rainbows and fairy tales. But let me tell you something. God is in control and when we trust in God, we know that God has our best interests in mind. Final, uh, third, number three for today, it's going to take diligence. It's going to take dedication to do this over and over and over. Again, it's not a singular act of obedience. It's a lifetime of obedience. That is true obedience. And finally, a respect, a fear, a, 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 an honoring of the Lord that says, God, because you are worthy, because you are God, and because you are above all else, I will listen to you and I will do what you ask of me today. Hey, listen, did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Hey, listen, I want to do one more thing. Thank you guys so much. It's amazing how few of you actually walk out when I say it three times. Praise God. It's like Jesus three times, right? I want to do one more thing. I want to ask you a question really quick. It would be a shame for us to have uh, praise and worship and to hear the word of God and, and, and to, to not give you the opportunity to determine your, your eternal outcome with, uh, and where you're going to be. Are you going to be with God forever and ever or what are you going to do? So I want to ask you this question. Are you, if you were to leave this place, it's a hypothetical question, but answer it within your heart. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but you know, nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. Uh, and now you might say, Pastor Luke, I'm going to go to heaven. And if you said, yes, I'm going to get into heaven, I want to ask you this question. What makes you think that you're going to get there? What makes you answer yes? And let's go over some of those answers. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I sure hope I'm going to get to heaven. I want to go. I really want to get there. Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you think, because you hope, or because you want or desire to get into heaven, that God's going to look on you and say, wow, they wanted it bad enough. They're going to, I'm going to let them in. You know, it's just not that way. You won't find it anywhere in the Bible that you can think, hope, or desire your way into heaven. You can't do it that way. You know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist or as a Hindu or as a Muslim or any other type of world religion or philosophical thought. So I guess by default, that means I'm a Christian and, and I'm going to go to heaven, right? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because you, were raised, you weren't raised as a, a Buddhist, as a Hindu or a Muslim or any other type of world religion or philosophical thought that means you're going to get into heaven? You can't find it anywhere in the Word of God because it's not there. You can't get to heaven that way. Hey, you know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, you know, uh, my parents took me to church as a baby. I was baptized or I was christened. Uh, they, they, they took me to church on Christmas and on Easter. All my life, they told me that I was a Christian. Here I am today. You know, I've got a cross or St. Christopher around my neck. You know, I went to Sabbath school, Sunday school or catechism classes. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because your parents baptized you or because you were christened as a baby, you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you sit in service on Christmas and on Easter that you're going to get into heaven or because your parents told you that you were a Christian because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes? Or how about this, because you've given yourself the title or the name of Christian mean that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents told you, because you come to church, or because you've given yourself the title of Christian mean you're going to get into heaven. Because there there's more to it than that. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way for you and I to get there, we can't get there our way, can't get there somebody else's way or some well-meaning church committee's way or anything of that nature. The only way we can get into God's heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ said this about himself. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. So you see, nothing you and I could do on the outside by our works we cannot do anything on the outside to get into heaven. The Bible tells us that our good deeds, hey, you may not have ever cheated on your taxes. Maybe you gave to the Sandy Relief effort or you, you give to humanitarian aid. You're a good person. Did you know that the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God are like filthy rags? You see, nothing we could do on our own makes us good enough to get there. A man by the name of Nicodemus in the book of John in the third chapter comes to Jesus and they begin to speak on the subject of eternal life. And, and Nicodemus, the Bible says of Nicodemus that he was of the Pharisees. He was a leader of the Jews. What that means to you and I is that Nicodemus in our day and age was like a PhD in theology, in the Bible. Nicodemus had memorized scripture. Nicodemus would teach in the temple. Nicodemus gave to the poor. He wore all the right clothes. And as they're speaking on the subject of eternal life, Jesus, you would think would look at Nicodemus and say, Nicodemus, man, on your way to heaven, you pat him on the back and say, dude, great is your reward. But let me tell you something. Jesus says something interesting and very direct to Nicodemus. And he says this to Nicodemus, a religious leader of his time. He says this, 
You must be born again. Now, you've heard that term. You've heard, you think Hollywood, popular culture, society, they made a mockery out of that. Think of radical weirdo, out of control Christianity. But you know what? It doesn't matter. I don't care what Hollywood is made out of that or popular culture because they have no concept of God. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, the idea or the term born again has always meant the same thing. And it means this, that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. You see, we can't get saved. The Bible says that we're not saved by works. We're not saved by, by what we do on the outside. But we're saved by what we do on the inside. But it's more than that too. It's about the whole package, all or nothing. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. And that's what he's after. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Let me prove that to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church and he says an interesting statement to the churches. He writes several letters to several churches and he says to them, he says, I know your works. Interesting, he doesn't say that to them, I know your hearts. I know your belief because it's an all or nothing. It's about the inside, your heart, and it's about the outside, your life. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. And he says, I know your works. And when I come back, I'm on my way back. And when I come back, I better find you hot, he says, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement. It's designed to get our attention. And what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians are deceived in thinking they're going to make it to heaven. What he's saying is that lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me describe it to you in terms of your relationship with God. Maybe you're a little bit in church, a little bit out of church, kind of ping-ponging between the world and between God coming back and going back, coming back and forth, in and out, in and out doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You got too much of God in you to, to enjoy the things of the world, but you got too much of the world in you to when you come to church to really grab a hold of the things of God, you're riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus says, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to get into heaven. It's not about the outward. It's not about our actions. It's not about our words. It's not about our mental ascent towards him. Ah, oh, but Pastor Luke, I know who Jesus is. The Bible says that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not, on, they're not on their way to heaven. It's about giving him all of our heart. It's about all of our life. You see, God has given us everything. He's done everything in his power to ensure that we make it to heaven by giving us his only begotten son, his most valuable possession, Jesus Christ. He gave us his everything in return, wants our all as well. So in a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible real loud, just like that. And when I smack my hand on the Bible, I want to, I'm, going to, I'm going to challenge you to be bold. I'm going to ask you in a moment, if that's you, when I smack my hand on the count of three, we'll do it together. I want you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by raising of your hands, you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give him all of my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to give God all of my life. I'm ready to go forward for God. I want to go and ensure my place in heaven forever and ever and ever. You know, you might say, but Pastor Luke, I, I can't raise my hand. People are going to see me, the person I came with. They're going to know. Listen, I'm going to be embarrassed. Hey, you know what? You might be embarrassed. You might face a moment of embarrassment. But wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment right now than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God? See, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force you or make you to do it. He's already done everything he could, and now the decision is yours. It's your free will. You can't raise the hand of the person next to you. You've got to make, each and every one of us have got to make this decision on our own. And Jesus Christ says this. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. The decision's yours. Each and every one of us have got to make this decision today. So who should get their hand up in a moment? Let me tell you, if you've never given him all of your heart, if you've never given him all your life in a moment, when I count to three, get your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and I'll put it right back down. Who should get their hands up? If you're not sure, maybe you did this as a child or as a kid in Sunday school, you don't know. Maybe you've never made a public profession of your faith. In a moment, get your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, I'll put it right back down. Or finally, in this place, who should get their hand up? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying, if you've been running from God instead of to God today, let's make today the day you quit playing games with God and quit messing around and get hot for Jesus Christ and ensure your place in heaven forever and ever and ever. Don't leave this place today without making sure that's in a gamble on your eternal life that you can't afford to make. So don't walk out of this place without making sure today 
I'm going to give you the opportunity in just a moment. Hands are getting ready to go up all across this auditorium. What you're doing, you're just saying, I want to surrender my heart. I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life today. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. I'll put it right back down from there. That's you in this place. Get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up in the name of Jesus. Here we go. Ready? One. That's you. Here we go. Two. Three. Let me see your hands in the house today. I see you. One, two, three, four. I see you. Keep your hands up so I can see them. If you raise your hands, four wise people, where are you at? Five, I see you in the back. Six, seven, I see you right back there. Eight, I see you. Eight wise people. Nine, I see you right there. Ten, eleven, I see you back there. Eleven wise people. Twelve, I see you right there. Twelve wise people. Anybody else in the house today? I see a hand. Thirteen, right there. Thirteen wise people. Fourteen, I see you in the family rooms. Anybody in the family rooms? Do I see, is there anybody in the family rooms? If, they, if you got your hands up. 14 wise people. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Where are you at in this place today? Saying, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. I see the ushers pointing a hand. Give me a, little, give me a little wave. Where are you at so I can see you? I'm not seeing. Where are you guys at? Help me out here. I see you right over there. Number 15. One in the foyer. Number 16. All right, 16 wise people. You say, man, I wonder if I should. Pastor, look, I feel like you're manipulating me. I feel like you're pushing me. Hey, I'm not manipulating, but I am pushing you. Don't you know that the devil's pushing you to keep your hand down and wants you to go to hell, but I'm fighting for you right now to get you into heaven, and I'm pushing you. I may rub you the wrong way, but that's okay. It's because I love you. 16 wise people. 17, I see you. 17 wise people. Anybody else in the place today? 17 wise people. Anybody else in the house today? 17. I see that. I've already seen that hand. 18, I see you right there. 18 wise people. Spirit of God's on this place. Come on. Let's go forward for God today. 19, I see you right there. I see that hand in the back, sir. I see you back there. You can put your hand down. 19 wise people. Where are you at? Number 20. 20, where are you at? I know you're in this place today. You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on. Let's go forward for God today. 19, where are you at? Number 20. Where are you at? Anybody else in the place today? Anybody else? Well, praise God for 19 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For the 19 of you that raised your hand, for number 20 that, raised, that didn't raise your hand, I want to ask you to be bold. You said you were going to give them all your heart. You said you were going to give them all your life. I want to pray with you. Let us change destinies together. Let us pray with you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking them to come into your heart. You acknowledge that you want to get saved by raising your hand. So I want to ask you to be bold. I want you to get your coat, your sweater, your Bible, your purse. Hey, listen, a friend, if you need a friend, grab somebody with you. Say, will you come with me? And I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to get out of your chair. Get into the aisle and come and meet me up at the altar. Let's change destinies together as we stand. Please, nobody leave at this time. If that's you, if you raised your hands, come on down. You come. Come on from the back, wherever you're at, in the family rooms, wherever you're at, you come. Come on. Today's your day. Come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come on. You can come. Come on. Oh, hear the Spirit call. Oh, come just as you are. Come on, if that's you, if you raise your hand, come on. you guys. Hey, listen, today is a new day. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Praise God. Today is a new day. Hey, I want to do some things. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is an amazing guy, great guy. He's going to do a couple things. He's going to take you right over there, right right down that hallway into, into a room. And I promise nothing weird goes on, okay? I promise. I am as weird as it gets, I promise. He's going to take you over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life, be the Lord, Savior of your life. So he's going to lead you in a prayer, real easy. He's going to give you some free things, some, some, um, some, some literature to help you get strong. Say, hey, you know, you say, I just got saved. Now what? We're going to help you with that. We're going to give you some things, put some things in your hands to get you strong in the ways of the Lord. And finally, he's going to uh, invite you into a program and, and introduce you to a friend that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym and you see a personal trainer. They help you build uh, the muscles. They make sure that you're exercising the right way so that you're effective in, in your workout. Well, we have Spiritual Personal Trainers. Friends, somebody will meet with you, buy you a cup of coffee right before service. They'll teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of the Lord for a couple of weeks there. And they're going to get you so that you don't go back to the things that you came from to get you strong in the ways of the Lord. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Joel. 
Congratulations. Hallelujah. Woo!